All right. Good morning once again. Good, morning. Uh, good to see you again this morning. We uh, we have been thinking about some of the contemporary issues that are going on in our society and things that, uh, of course, these things have a way of affecting the church. Uh, yesterday, we thought about some some specific things that are going on sort of out in the world, and we wanted to make sure we were at least thinking about these things the right way and we could approach them and deal with them in a way that would be consistent with what God wants from us. And I mentioned during the Bible class hour, I'm I'm sort of making a little bit of a turn here. I want us to start thinking about some contemporary issues uh, maybe in the church and not problems that we have in the church, but but the fact is the environment that we operate in is changing and that should require us to stop and think for a few moments about how we should be interacting based on what is going on. Uh, We thought in the Bible class hour about a Christian's perspective on persecution. You know, how do we look at it? How do we think about it? And I suggested to you that how we see it is going to affect how we handle it. Let's look at it from God's perspective. Let's see what he is accomplishing, what good he can bring about, how it will help somebody else. Because you know what? Persecution is not going to rob us of our reward unless we let it. I want us to think at this hour about how we actually handle adversity when it comes from our government and our society. We need to look at it the right way, but ultimately we have to deal with it. And that's what I want us to think about. The book of Daniel is a great book to think about this. There are just so many examples in this particular book. And so I want to use this book and I want to use several of the accounts in this book to help us see how godly people can deal with and handle adversity, particularly when it comes from the government, when it comes from our society. Daniel chapter one, perhaps you recall when the book opens, it's the third year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, the Bible tells us that Nebuchadnezzar was used by God. He was God's servant sent to punish his people because the people had not been faithful to God. They had broken covenant with him and they needed to be chastened. And so God uses Nebuchadnezzar to come and remove his people from the land of promise so that the land could have rest. They had, among other things, ignored the Sabbath rest that they were supposed to give the land. So God was going to give the land rest. And he did that by removing the people from the land. The Bible tells us that Nebuchadnezzar had gone in and besieged the city of Jerusalem. Now, he was expert. At breaking down a city's walls, Jerusalem was set on a hill. It was surrounded by walls, but but God used this man and the walls were not going to stop him. He surrounded the city, besieged it. He battered down the city's walls and he went in and took the best of the people in that land captive and carried them back to his homeland in Babylon. Along the way, he plundered the temple took away the golden vessels and valuables that God had his people to place in their place of worship, left the land and the people and the temple desolate. He has, among others, Daniel and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. He has them now in Babylon and these men are in his court He has the the master, the prince, the chief of his eunuchs, his special servants. And they are supposed to deal with these young men, deal with these boys to to raise them up and to help them become suitable for his purposes. Among other things, he wants to change how they see things. They have a new home. They're not in Jerusalem anymore. They're not in Judah anymore. They're in Babylon. He wants them to have a new language. He wants them to learn his language. He wants them to use his vocabulary. He wants them to have uh, 
sort of a new name. He gives them names after his pagan gods. You know, I like to use Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah because those are, those are names that respect God. He calls them by these pagan names that he gives them. Even Daniel gave him a pagan name named after his gods. He gives them new education. Remember, he wants them to be raised in all the wisdom of the Babylonians and the Chaldeans. He wants them to think like him. These are God's children. He wants them to be useful for his purposes, not God's. And so he wants to co-opt these young people. It's interesting. It's interesting. When the devil tries to when the devil tries to go after people, you know, he's got to go after the young because those who those of us who are older, those of us who are grounded, we're rooted. You know, we're going to die eventually. But if he can get the minds of the young people, see, the future of that particular people is going to be a lot different than it would be if he couldn't. I see some parallels in our own society. You know how we try to reeducate young people, give them new values and things like that. But one of the things that that Nebuchadnezzar wants to give these young people is a new diet. Now, it's interesting because pagans and heathens had a different diet than the people of Israel because God gave them a special diet. There were certain things that they could not eat because God said these things were unclean. And there were certain things that they simply would not eat because, for example, maybe these meats had been sacrificed to idols and so forth. And so they would not eat certain things. These uh, young people had undoubtedly been marched from Judah all the way to Babylon. They were probably in pretty bad shape. And now you take the best of those young people. And Nebuchadnezzar says, I want to treat them in a special way. So that at the end of end of three years or so, they can stand before me in my court and serve me. It seems that most of the young people went along with that. You know, you think about it. They were in a pretty bad circumstance. And here's the king says, I'll treat you special. I'll give you food from my table. You'll be able to eat better than everybody else. You'll be more comfortable than everybody else. But Daniel. The Bible says of him in verse number eight. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's dainties. That is his delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, look at what happens here. Daniel has a commitment to maintaining his purity before his God. Now, this is a young man. I can't tell you exactly how old he is, but see, this is a boy. He may have been no older than my oldest son. My oldest son's 11. He may have been no older than that. And if he was older, he was just a little bit older. He was still a boy. Somewhere along the way, this young person had cultivated in his heart and in his mind a commitment to purity before his God. And so then when the government, this foreign power tries to impose on him and corrupt him, he says, I'm not interested. I've already made my mind up that I'm going to be pure before my God. And it may mean that my life is going to be a little less convenient than somebody else's, but I'm going to maintain my purity. You're not going to buy my soul with a good meal. You're not going to buy my soul by making my life circumstances a little bit more comfortable. I'm willing to go without in order to maintain my purity. I'm going to tell you something. We need to. We need to prepare our young people a little better than we sometimes do. When you can get these young people into the building and get them in a classroom and spend a little time with them. Listen, don't spend all that time playing games. Help them cultivate in their hearts a commitment to purity because they are the ones who are going to have to deal with what's coming in this country more than we will. And they need to be prepared in that early. Daniel says, no, listen, I have purposed in my heart. I've already made my mind up. I will not defile myself. Now, here's something that he does that I find that many times Christians don't do. You know what we do? We bellyache and we cry because we don't like what's going on. 
Daniel goes to the person in charge and says, listen, I'd like to see if we can work this thing in a way where I won't be in a position where you're asking me to defile myself. He at least makes the effort and ask if we can do this in a way where what the king wants will not be in conflict with what my God wants. And the Bible says in verse number nine, God made Daniel to find compassion and kindness in the sight of this unit. God will make a way for people who have a commitment to being pure. God will make a way, but you have to have the commitment first. Don't make compromises with the world. If you want to be right with your God, when it becomes difficult and the government and society leans on you and tries to compel you, tries to corrupt you, you have to have a commitment first. I don't care what you say or do. I'm not going to compromise my purity before my God. If you want to handle adversity, friends, you've got to have that. See, too many people are willing Too many people are willing to make compromises when sometimes compromise is not possible if you want to be right. Daniel, obviously, as a young person, defines success a little differently than some other people. He did not define success as him being able to to get the best job or to have the highest degrees. He defines success as living a life faithful to God. That man had a commitment to purity. In 1 Timothy 5, in verse 22, the Bible says, Paul says to Timothy there, lay hands on no man suddenly. But then he says, listen to it. Keep yourself pure. We have to have a commitment to doing that. And of course, ultimately, you know how this ends. Uh, God blesses Daniel and his three friends. The Bible tells me if you look at it, He blesses them socially. He blesses them physically. He blesses them spiritually. Verse 17 sort of sets the the tone for the whole book. In verse 17, it tells us that God blessed Daniel to have knowledge and skill and learning and wisdom and gave him understanding of visions and dreams. That sets the tone for the whole book that God blessed this man in a special way like that. But he also blessed him professionally. Daniel, you know how this book goes. Daniel excelled professionally because God was with him. Now, why was God with him? Because even as a young man, he was committed to maintaining his purity before his God. And so if we're going to deal with adversity, we have to have this commitment to purity and God will provide. Daniel chapter three focuses on Daniel's friends. Now we know them better as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but uh, I sort of think of those as their slave names. You know, these are the names the heathen gave them, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The Bible tells us that when Daniel was promoted, he was given charge uh, a high rank, a high position there in Nebuchadnezzar's uh, administration, and he remembered his friends. And he suggested that his friends also be elevated, and they were. Now, these three men were given charge over the chief province of Babylon. In Daniel chapter 3, we see something that is uh, sort of interesting, because maybe we don't, if we don't think about this carefully, we don't recognize the significance of it. Nebuchadnezzar builds a statue. Here's the thing that always uh, just kind of amazes me, boggles my mind. Everybody watched him build a statue. And then he says, now, listen, I want all the leaders, all the leaders throughout my provinces to come so you can bow down and worship the statue that I made. Everybody knew he just made it. But he still says, you're going to come and bow down and worship this God. Everybody comes. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they come. The king has made a decree, so they had to be there. The music is playing and people are supposed to bow down and worship when the music plays. Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, they do not bow down. See, dedications like this were common in the ancient Near East. Now, they were wrapped up in religiosity and so forth. But really, the purpose of these things was to get people to pledge allegiance to the king and to the empire. 
You can worship whatever you want. But everybody in this empire is going to worship this God that I made. That proves your loyalty to me above your God. That proves your loyalty to this kingdom above your God. The Romans did the same thing. That's why Christians suffered the way that they did, because they said, listen, you can do whatever you want. But see, when it comes time for you to worship at these stations that we have set up, you're going to do that. And if you don't do that, you're a bad citizen. And if you won't do that, we've got something that we do for bad citizens. We send them to the lion's den and so forth. And that's what happened to Christians in the first century. This is the same circumstance. These Christians or these uh, people of God saw the heard the music. Saw everybody else bowing down. But they had the faith to stand when everybody else bowed. The king got word, you know, that somebody comes to him and says, listen, you know, those three guys that you promoted over everybody else. You know, you promoted these three guys. uh, They don't care anything about you. They heard the decree. They know what you said. The rest of us are down here on our hands and our knees. We're showing our loyalty. We're showing our love. These guys don't care anything about you. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, he obviously knew who these guys were, and he kind of respected these guys a little bit because he didn't jump right on them. Maybe he had a good breakfast, you know. He says, listen, is this true what I've heard? Uh, You three boys aren't aren't bowing down when the music starts. I tell you, we. We got a problem here, but uh, I'm going to give you a second chance. You know, now Nebuchadnezzar, from everything I have read and researching this man, he was not a, a king of second chances necessarily. He said, I'm going to give you boys a give you boys a second chance. Now, listen, let's fire the music up. When this when this music starts again, everybody's going to bow. And uh, you three boys, you you need to bow. And uh, as long as you bow, we have no problem. But if you don't, you see that fiery furnace over there. If you guys don't bow, you're going in. And he says, who is the God who's going to deliver you out of my hand? See, he challenges their God. These people he knew he knew these were people who loved and respected God, but he didn't care. Listen, you're going to do what I want you to do. Whoever you worship, you're going to do what I want you to do. Whatever you think about God in heaven. See, and if you're not willing to do what I'm telling you, that's what I have for you. The burning fiery furnace. You're going in and who's going to stop me? These three boys. Had a. Had a dynamic faith. See, in Daniel three and verse 16, the text says Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Again, these are their uh, their captive names. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. We we're not going to call a meeting to figure this out. We, we don't have to powwow. We don't need a bunch of extra time. We're not going to answer. I like the way the uh, the King James uh, renders this. You know, uh, we have we we are not careful to answer you in this matter. We don't care. We don't care what you're talking about. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, will deliver us out of the burning fiery furnace. Listen to it. Our God is able to keep us from going into the burning, fiery furnace and out of your hand. O king, listen, the God we serve, he's bigger than you. He's better than you. And if you think you're going to do something to us, if he doesn't want it to happen, it won't happen. But then they say. But if not. See, we kind of figure he's not going to let us go in there. But we may not have this thing right because he didn't tell us we didn't have to go in. But see, the bottom line is, even if we do have to go in, we will not serve your gods nor worship the golden image that you have made. We are willing to stand in the face of the burning, fiery furnace. Even when everybody else gets down on their hands and knees and makes a fool of themselves worshiping something they just saw you build. We won't do it. These men had the faith to stand. Now, listen. 
Now, you know about how Nebuchadnezzar took that. He was highly upset. See, the government, the government cannot handle people who value their faith in God above their allegiance to the government. Governments get upset if you recognize a higher power and authority than them. So what they do is they say, listen, we've got to make some examples of these guys. So the next people know when we say jump, they say how high. Nebuchadnezzar was beside himself. You heat that thing up seven times hotter than it's supposed to be. I'm going to make a I'm going to make an example out of these guys. Heat that thing up. And then he had some strong men to go and throw them into the burning, fiery furnace. It was so hot. The guys who were throwing them in died trying to get them in there. (laughs) He was beside himself. Now, we've got these three boys. They wouldn't bow. They had the face to stand. They said, God is going to keep us out of the burning, fiery furnace. But even if we do have to go in. We still won't bow. Now they're in there. And you see, the king sees something he wasn't expecting. Wait a minute now. Didn't we throw three guys in there? Weren't they bound when we put them in there? Well, how is it that I see four men walking around in there? And why is it that that fourth one looks like a a son of the gods. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was a pagan. He wasn't thinking Jesus Christ. You know, he's a son of the gods. It looks like a supernatural being in there. How in the world is that going on? See, now he has a now he has a change of heart, change of mind. What are y'all doing in there? <laughs> Somebody get those guys out. They come out. They don't smell like smoke. They come out. They haven't been hurt at all. Now he understands. See, the question in his mind, who is the God who's going to deliver you from my hand? Now you got your answer. You challenge my faith. You challenge my God. I'm going to stand with my God and my God is going to show you that he's bigger and stronger than you are. See, now Nebuchadnezzar, this happens time and again to Nebuchadnezzar. Now he's like, oh, wait a minute. I'm going to tell you something. Uh, Nobody in my kingdom better say a bad word about the God of these guys. God is glorified only because these three men had the faith to stand. If you want to see Jesus be lifted up in America as America becomes more antagonistic toward Christianity, here's what you can't do. You can't bow. You have to stand and let America see that Jesus is truly Lord indeed. If you bow and compromise, people will never see that. And you got to be willing to go into the furnace. God never made a promise that you weren't going in. And he didn't promise that you're going to come out. You got to have enough faith and trust in him. It doesn't matter what you do. There are just some things that are not going to happen. I'm not going to bow to your paganism. I'm not going to cooperate in ungodly things. It just doesn't matter what you do. We don't need to call a summit. We don't need to have a big meeting. It's not going to happen. Now, God uh, did not keep these three boys out of the furnace. Sometimes we think, you know, God is going to keep me out. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. But you know what he did? He brought them through the furnace. He didn't keep them out. But he brought him through. That's the kind of God that we serve. And if you're going to deal with adversity from the government, listen, the government is stronger than any one of us. The government is stronger than a group of us when it comes to carnal warfare and so forth. The government is not stronger than our God. There's a third example I like to look at in this book. And there are others. I just picked these because they're familiar to us. And I think that the application sometimes maybe we don't see. These are not things that just happened a long time ago for us to give give to our children as nursery rhymes. These are things that happened a long time ago for our learning so we can see how to handle what's going on in our world today. In Daniel chapter 6, you remember Daniel has some difficulties of his own. 
We see a commitment to purity in chapter one. We see the faith to stand in chapter three. And here in chapter six, we see a persistence to pray. There was a temptation. There is a temptation sometimes for Christians to fall away in the face of adversity in order to try to get away from it. Now think about what's going on here in Daniel chapter six In Daniel chapter six and verse number one. Darius is setting up his kingdom now. Now, Darius and uh, and he, the Medes and the Persians had overcome the Babylonians and the Chaldeans. In the previous chapter, we see that Belshazzar, who was likely a descendant of Nebuchadnezzar, was killed. And the kingdom now goes into the hands of the Babylon or the uh, uh, Medes and the Persians. And Darius wants to set his kingdom up. And so he sets up one hundred and twenty provinces or so. And he's got a ruler over each one of them. Uh, some translations would say satraps, but these are provincial rulers. Maybe we would call them governors or the equivalent of governors. And so he's got a lot of space here. I've got governors over each one of these provinces and I've got three men who are over all these governors. They're going to watch the people who are watching the people, you know, because he doesn't want to suffer any damage. I don't want anybody stealing anything. I want people doing what they're supposed to do. So I've got three men watching the 120. I just want you to think about this. Daniel, a captive in chapter one. Now, Darius is minded to set him over the whole realm. He's got 120 people. Daniel is above them. He's got three above the 120. And he says, I'm going to put him over those guys. You tell I'm telling you, God can God can do some things. God will take care of faithful people. Now, Daniel is doing his job and he's doing a good job. His uh, enemies or his political rivals uh, are not pleased with his successes. So they go to the king and they ask the king to pass a law that says that no one can can ask anything of any God or man other than him for 30 days. Well, now, why do they do that? They were looking for a way to bring Daniel down. The Bible says they were looking for an occasion against him. That word occasion has to do with a pretext. They were just trying to find something. They would make up something if they could concerning his work, but they couldn't find anything concerning his work because he was faithful. God's people ought to be the kind of people that if somebody wants to bring you down because you're not doing a good job in your work, you don't have integrity in your work. They shouldn't be able to find anything. They couldn't find anything. Daniel wasn't the kind of guy showing up an hour late, leaving an hour early, you know, (laughs) taking a box of pencils out of the out of the closet because school's going to start next week. See, he wasn't that kind of guy. So they said, the only way we're going to find an occasion, the only way we're going to come up with something to bring this man down is if we find it concerning the law of his God. Now, we know he's the kind of man who's not going to go against what his God says. So if we can set the law so that it conflicts with the law of his God, then we can get him. And that's what they did. They go to the king and ask him to pass this law. No one can pray to any man or God except you. And the king goes along with that. Now, they told him, listen, we all got together and we all thought this was a good idea. So we are asking you to do this. We, your advisors, the people you trust. Now, who is all? Because Daniel obviously wasn't there. This was this was a game they were playing. Now, it's interesting because Daniel, the Bible says in verse number 10, Daniel six and verse number 10, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he knew what the law was. He went into his house and his it, the windows in his house were open toward Jerusalem and he he bowed down. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and he prayed and gave thanks. Listen to this as he did a four time. This is who he was. He was a man of faith. And part of being a person of faith is that he's going to pray to his God. And you can't pass a law that's going to make a man of God not be a man of God. I'm going to pray to my God. Now, he wasn't trying to flaunt it. He wasn't trying to be a rebel. 
He wasn't standing out on the street corner making a spectacle of himself, but he wasn't trying to hide it. See, it was private, but it wasn't secret. You see the difference. He goes into his house. He's got the windows wide open. But that's different than standing out on somebody's street corner trying to start something. But either way it goes, he's going to pray to his God. Now, these men, they know where to find Daniel. They know what he's doing. They go and they see him praying. They see him praying more than once. They go back to the king. You know, this guy, Daniel, you know, the one you were thinking uh, you were going to set up over everybody else. He doesn't care anything about you. The law has been passed. Didn't you pass this law? This man is praying to his God three times every day. (laughs) Now, the king, the king at this point sees what's going on. And the king said his mind. Let me see if I can. Well, if there's a let me see if I can if I can work this because this isn't what I wanted. Then they start to lean on the king. No, no. Wait a minute now. Wait a minute. You know, our law. Once you say it, you can't go back on it. Now, you can make the law, but you can't change it. And you said 30 days. They knew that 30 days was more than enough time to catch a man like Daniel praying. I sometimes wonder. How long would it take for somebody to catch some of us praying? They knew 30 days was more than enough time for him. I'm persuaded for some of us, it might take a little longer than that for somebody to catch us praying. (laughs) The king wanted to get Daniel out of this. But based on the way their law worked, it couldn't. See, here's something else that I think is interesting. Sometimes laws get passed in a society that are contrary to Christians Not because the people who are passing the laws want to do Christians harm, but sometimes people have an agenda and people who are not Christians, they don't see it coming. They'll pass certain things and they'll require certain things and those things will have an impact on Christians. They don't see it because they're not Christians themselves. Some of the things that happen in our society are not because people hate Christians. They're just not thinking anything about Christians. See? And there are some other people who will advocate and push and try to get folks to do things. And it winds up having a bad impact on us, but not necessarily because the people who pass the law don't like us. It's just how it is. And so Daniel goes into the lion's den because that was the punishment that was prescribed. Nebuchadnezzar or Darius says, listen, you know, is your God able to deliver you? I hope he is. He goes home. He has a restless night. He's not interested in uh, singing and merriment. He's not interested in having a good time or being entertained. He, He goes. He can hardly sleep. He gets up early in the morning and goes back and calls out. Daniel, has your God been able to deliver you? Yes, he has. Yes, he has. He shut the mouths of these lions. Everything's all right. I'm fine. Get Daniel out of here. Get Daniel out of the lion's den. And those guys who were responsible, put them in. Now, listen. Those lions didn't touch Daniel, but those lions were capable of eating. Now, you know how I know that, because the men who went in never made it to the bottom. Those lions devoured them before they hit the bottom, the men and their families, everything that pertained to them. And Daniel came out of there without any problem at all. Uh, What I'm saying here. We have to be persistent. In doing what we know God wants us to do. In this case, it was prayer. But it's more general than that. Meeting, worshiping, living the Christian life, being an example of who God wants us to be publicly and privately. Christianity is not going to be a secret for faithful people. And you can pass whatever law you want. You can pass whatever law you want. If it conflicts with God's law, when we know the right and the sign, we're still going to do what God says. It's better to obey God than men. Bible tells me in James five and verse 13, is any among you suffering? Let him pray. Daniel went to his God in prayer and he overcame his enemies because he was persistent in doing what God wanted done. The text in chapter six is pretty clear. If you look at verse 23, 
Then was the king exceeding glad and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no manner of hurt was found upon him. Listen to the reason why, because he had trusted in his God. How are you going to deal with adversity from the government? I'm going to tell you something. You need to have a commitment to purity. You need to have the faith to stand and you need to have the persistence to pray and do what God wants you to do. We need to trust him. We need to trust him. We cannot compromise on the things he tells us to do. We cannot compromise on anything that would make us impure in his sight. We can't do it. And if that means we have to go into the burning, fiery furnace, we're going. Amen. We're going because we know our God will deliver us. Maybe he'll keep us from it. Maybe he'll bring us through it. But if we don't come through it, guess what? We still trust our God. Amen. We may have to go into the lion's den. Listen, don't want to prefer not to. But I prefer to go in there than I do to lose my own soul. Amen. So we have to trust him. We can handle adversity from the government. We can handle adversity from society. We look at persecution the way God wants us to look at it, and we handle it the way he wants us to handle it, and we will have the victory along with him. Amen. Yes, we will. The only reason any of this makes sense to me is because I know that Jesus is the Son of God. That's the only reason any of this makes any sense to me. I know that the Lord, if my life is stronger than any Lord this world has to offer. I know that no matter who sits on the throne, the president, I know no matter who they put on the Supreme Court, you know, that's a big deal. And I'm listen, I, this is my work here. I'm concerned. I want to see who they put up there, but it doesn't matter who they put up there. I'm going to stick with God. I'm going to handle it. Because he is going to handle it for me. I just need to cooperate with him. And it's the same with you. It's the same with this congregation. It's the same with any congregation anywhere. You stick with God because you know that Jesus is Lord. Jesus died for my sins. He died for yours. He took his life up again on the third day to show us that it is possible for us also to overcome even death. There is nothing this world can do to separate us from the love of our God. And Paul talks about that in Romans 8. He says, even death is not going to separate you. If you believe that Jesus is Lord, you accept his authority, that means you're going to have to do what he says. So we don't have a good concept of Lord in this country, I don't think. Because we, we've, been we've been deceived into thinking we live in a democracy and we don't. But we at least have been deceived into thinking that it's a democracy. It's not. It's not. Majority doesn't win. That's what a democracy is. It's not that. But there are some places in the world where in more recent times people actually had lords. People who ruled and reigned and made laws and punished lawbreakers. One man. Now, that's what Jesus is. He's Lord. There is no election. He's Lord. He makes the laws. And if you accept him as Lord in your life, that means he makes the laws. We'll do what he says. See, that's why we have to repent, every one of us, because we've been making our own laws. We've just been doing what we wanted to do. But as soon as you say Jesus is Lord, then you say, no, I've got to do what he says. I've got to do what he says. And if he says anything inconsistent with what I've been wanting to do, what I've been doing in my life, then I have to change. You know why? Because the Lord is going to be the Lord. He's not going to change. We repent of our sin. Change our life to come into conformity with his will. We confess Jesus is the son of God. That's how he has this authority, because he is the son of almighty God. And according to him, we have to be baptized to wash our sins away. I don't get a vote on this. You don't either. Somebody said, well, listen, I'd like to uh, I'd like to be saved this way. Somebody said, well, I kind of I'm interested in this way of salvation. Jesus is Lord. He says this is how it has to be done. He that believes in his baptized is going to be saved. You can't argue with the Lord. 
And that's what he says. So we we have to be baptized to have our sins washed away. Jesus said it, Mark 16, 15, 16. And we have to live lives that are faithful. You know, even if you do what is required of you to become a part of uh, the kingdom of Christ. If after that you were to decide to live your life as a lawbreaker, the same Lord who gives the law is going to enforce the law. And he's going to punish lawbreakers. So even if you've already become a part of the kingdom of Christ and and you've been living your life in a way that is rebellious and you've been breaking the law. Listen, we got a good Lord, don't we? Merciful and kind. But he's righteous, too. (laughs) Better go ahead and repent. Better go ahead and ask for forgiveness. He's faithful and just to forgive us, the Bible says. But we need to repent first. And if there's anything like that in your life or. If you stand in need of prayer uh, because the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous, it avails much. I like to say it makes a difference. It matters to God. And so if we can pray with you and for you, we'd be happy to do that. Would you let us know how we can help if we can while we stand and sing this song of invitation?